Thank you, Francisco. We're very lucky to have you back at MIT. Uh, and I'm especially proud to introduce uh, the next speaker. Uh, she is Joao Strela, the current Charles W. and Jennifer C. Johnson clinical investigator. Joao Strela is a pediatric oncologist at Dana-Farber Boston Children's Cancer Center and Blood Disordered Center, an instructor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and our new clinical investigator at the MIT Koch Institute. She received her MD from Northwestern University in 2013. And in 2016, she completed a residency in pediatrics at University of Washington. In 2017, during her fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, she joined my lab at the Koch Institute as a postdoctoral fellow, focusing her research on nanotechnology-based drug delivery platforms. She is a board-certified uh, pediatric uh, oncologist. She works in pediatric hematology and oncology, and her clinical practice is focused on the care of children with tumors of the brain and spinal cord. So let's welcome Joelle Strela. Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the chance to, to present a little bit of data here today. Um, speaking of languages, as we talked about earlier, I really came from a very different language. Um, so about five years ago when I was training as a pediatric oncologist, I, I was quite intimidated about the idea of choosing a research direction, but I knew that drug delivery was something we needed in the clinic. Um, and so really, to me, all low roads led to the Koch Institute, and I was very fortunate to, to be part of the convergence science that's going on here. Um, and so today I'll talk to you a little bit, a short story about nanomedicine at the interface, um, thinking about both the space between nanoparticles and cells, and then also I think there's some opportunities for, for real collaboration with this project and, and hopefully even some others here in the audience. And so I think when it comes to nanomedicine, on one hand, it doesn't need much introduction. It's been around for decades and decades, and many of us had a nanoparticle vaccine in our arms in the last two years. But I thought I would just frame it as um, some of the things that really excited me when I first came to the Koch Institute. The idea that we could put a targeted agent into a targeted drug carrier with the possibility of bringing a specific cargo to a specific tissue in the body or even a specific organelle in the cell is extremely exciting, especially for a clinical oncologist. But it's hard to talk about one end of the coin without talking about the other. Um, and so in reality, most phase one and phase two trials of, of nanoparticle therapeutics have been really exciting, and most phase three trials, a little less so. And I think a lot of that has come down to, you know, is the right patient getting the right drug? Are they getting the right dose? Do they have the right subtype of cancer? And sometimes these problems can feel a little bit impossible to solve. There are also more than one barrier to getting a nanoparticle therapeutic to the right cell. And so there's tissue barriers, there's biologic barriers, um, there's even manufacturing barriers, stability barriers, patient selection, um, and it goes on and on. But today I'll tell you a short story of how we really sought to interrogate nanobio interactions with the hope that this might have some downstream effects of helping us to accumulate nanoparticles into tumor, tumor cells um, and also think about patient selection for clinical trials. And so I'm quite humbled and honored today to present a little bit of this work really on behalf of a big team. Um, and so I actually give Paula quite a bit of credit for hiring two um, people who speak different languages right at the same time. So uh, I joined Paula Hammond's lab at the same time as Dr. Natalie Bunka, who is an organic chemist. And in fact, our desks were right next to each other. And it was a fortunate that we met um, and started to learn how to speak the same language and actually developed um, the idea for this project together. And so we co-led this. And it wouldn't have been helpful, uh, been able to do without the help of Angela Kohler, who has a lot of experience in high throughput screening and, and also speaks a little bit of the language of systems biology. And so we were able to all come together, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about our idea and some of the early data. And so we had this idea that we tend to look at nanoparticles one at a time, in one cancer type at a time, and even in one cell line at a time. And we might dive really deep into that one idea but what if we could zoom out? And what if we could really spread our intentions over um, many cancer cell lines at the same time? And we're fortunate that at the Broad Institute, there is a, a wonderful resource called the PRISM platform of DNA barcoded cells. And so for this project, we devised a nanoparticle library of 35 chemically diverse nanoparticles, including some that have the exact same core material, but a different surface, as well as those with the exact same surface and a different core material. And this will make a little sense later. 
And by looking at these with pooled barcoded cancer cell lines, we were able to come up with an interaction profile. And so um, for this, we used a technique where we had labeled the nanoparticles with a fluorescence molecule. And then we could use a relatively simple um, technique of sorting the cells based on their fluorescence and come out with cells that had really high affinity and cells that had a lot less affinity. And so what does this kind of data look like? On the one hand, you can think about it as each nanoparticle, is it acting similarly to each other? And you might have had the idea, as we did, that nanoparticles with the same surface would act similarly. And so what you're seeing here in this plot is actually collapsing down the interactions of 488 cancer cells into one number, and then comparing each nanoparticle to each other, to the other nanoparticles. And what we saw was actually the core of the nanoparticle. And so we had cores that were lipid-based nanoparticles and two different polymers, one called PLGA, which is actually a commonly used clinical formulation, um, and one polystyrene, which is a little bit more of a preclinical biologic tool that actually many of you might, might use in your labs. And we saw that the core materials seemed to have a stronger effect um, than the surface, at least when you zoom out and look at the bulk. And if you collapse down the data in a different way, in this case, collapsing down the interaction profile of all 35 nanoparticles and say, do these cells track together or not? Probably not surprising to many of you, they really didn't. And so in fact, not all lung cancer cell lines are the same. But on the one hand, we know there is something driving these interactions. And so this is where I think conversion science really starts to come together uh, because the reason we used DNA barcoded cell lines was that so we could take advantage of the huge resources that are uh, available in the omics community. And so for this project, we worked very closely with the PRISM team at the Broad Institute. Um, and as many of you know, and if you don't, you should really check them out, there is um, two really wonderful resources that are freely available to use um, called the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia and the Dependency Map. And so this helps people who may not speak the language of omics have access to a lot of omics data. And so what does this practically mean? It means for each of those 488 cancer cell lines, we knew a lot about the cell line. We knew the mutation profile. We knew the gene expression profile. We knew the proteomics of many of these as well. And so in fact, with the help of um, excellent computational biologists um, and Jen Roth's team at the PRISM platform, we were able to basically take away the cell lines and replace each of those with millions of data points telling us about the biology of what goes on in that particular cell. And so using univariate analyses as well as multivariate analyses, our hope was to get a sense of are there biologic features governing nanoparticle interaction with cancer cells. I'm going to show you just a couple flavors of this data because I think I'm not sure we all have the appetite right before lunch to look at 35 different heat maps or, or 42 <laughs> different um, time points here. But this is an example of a layer-by-layer -layer nanoparticle. And so you'll see here that there's a liposome core, um, which can hold drugs. There's two polymer layers, and the outer layer here is called fucoidin. Um, and this is a natural polysaccharide. Um, and actually, there's quite a bit of interest in developing fucoidin nanoparticles for the clinic. And what we were surprised to see is that there are not just hundreds, but up to thousands of candidate biomarkers that are statistically linked um, with delivery of or a high affinity interaction with that particle. And so all the dots up to the right hand side are features of the cell that um, are statistically correlated with higher interaction, and on the left, things that are statistically correlated with low interaction between a cancer, part a cancer cell and a nanoparticle. But then take, for example, a clinical formulation that we included as a benchmark. So uh, this is a non-drug-loaded formulation, an analog version of onivide. And so in this case, the surface of the liposome is pegylated, um, which is polyethylene glycol, which is really meant to extend the circulation time in the body. And as you can see, there's a huge abrogation in the number of biologic features that were seen as statistically relevant. And this is not too surprising from the nanomaterials side, but I think as a clinician, we tend to think we're using a targeted drug when we pull this one off the shelf. And we need to remind ourselves that it's really not meant to interact with the cells. And in fact, we were also able to um, use things like a, a validated compound. Here, this is a biosimilar of cetuximab or an EGFR antibody that's non-lethal. And so by putting um, kind of a homing agent onto the nanoparticle, we're able to see that, yes, in fact, if you put a, a, a very um, a very specific antibody on the outside of a lipid-based nanoparticle, you can pull out the biologic features. Cells that have really high expression of EGFR, um, those nanoparticles interacted strongly. So this gave us a nice hint that we were getting real data out of this screen, um, but what did we do with these you know, thousands upon thousands of candidate biomarkers? 
One way that you can look at these is actually just by looking at the sheer number and the significance across our data set. So this is what I would consider the, the bird's eye view. Um, and a couple of the things we see is that there's time dependence to the number of candidate biomarkers for a given nanoparticle. And there's also quite a bit of diversity. Um, we see that different cores have different trends, um, as well as the different surfaces. So even though I said the core of the material, the core material was really important at the beginning, it's not that the surface is unimportant. In fact, both things matter. And so you might ask, are these the features you might expect? You know, are you pulling out the biologic features that are, regulate, that are known to regulate engagement at the cell surface or trafficking within the surface? Um, and so in fact, yes, when we look across known data sets um, of things like cell engagement, ABC transporters, solute carriers, we are getting a lot of candidate biomarkers in those areas. Um, but it's not a one-size-fits-all. So each nanoparticle is slightly different, and you may see some trends across the nanoparticle core or across the nanoparticle surface. We were also very interested in looking at this in an unbiased way. And so here we're showing um, the random forest features. So rather than a univariate analysis where you're getting kind of a statistical number of, of correlation, this is kind of a the most simple of the machine learning algorithms that can tell you the importance, the relative importance of that one feature for predicting your end result. And so when we take the, the biomarkers that were predicted by random forest to be important and we cluster them using k-means to kind of, I think of it as helping my eyes to see which ones might be in common, we can then say, you know, in an unbiased way, are these relevant? Are these biologically interacting with each other? And so prediction-wise, they would be. So taking these two groups of, of candidate genes, and these are all from gene expression profiles, I should mention, and putting them into string DB, we see that there's actually a very, very high protein-protein interaction chance between all of these. So we hope this might be our, our footpath, for instance, um, to systems biology. Are we able to actually start to define a little better how a nanoparticle interacts with and traffics with cells? Um, because in fact, these things haven't been very well described. And in the last few minutes, I just want to show a short vignette about um, not exactly zooming out, but, but zooming back in. And so you've seen a little bit of the data of these kind of three chosen nanoparticles that I wanted to show you today at four hours of interaction. So if you let the cells and the nanoparticles linger together for a short period of time. If you let them go for a little bit longer, you start to see an interesting trend. And so we had one gene that came out of our screen, um, SLC46A3, which was unexpected, nothing we'd ever heard of before, nothing that has been associated with nanoparticle delivery before, but it comes out as a very specific um, liposome biomarker. And so what does this look like in our data? It looks like from the random forest uh, plots that SLC46A3 expression is specifically predicted within liposomal formulations to be very important. And what does it look like in the raw data? Here we're seeing each cell line as a dot, and we're looking at the expression level of SLC46A3 on the x-axis, and the interaction profile, or the weighted average, on the y-axis. So dots that are up higher had much stronger interaction with those particles, and dots that were lower, the opposite. And again, we see this is a lipid-based lipid nanoparticle-specific phenomenon, but in fact a negative reaction, a negative relationship. So cells with very low expression actually have high affinity for the particles. So I'll show you just a few um, kind of early experiments we've done to validate this gene, but we hope this is kind of a, a, a very first of many in terms of which biomarkers we're going to be looking at. And so the first thing we did was take some, a cell line that has uh, we took a cell line that had very high expression and very low affinity for lipid-based nanoparticles, and we took a cell line that had very low expression and very high affinity for lipid-based nanoparticles. And if we transiently knock down SLC46A3, we can predictably increase the nanoparticle association or engagement with that cell. And then if we do a permanent modulation using either a lentiviral vector to overexpress SLC46A3 in a cell line that does not natively express it, um, we can abrogate the nanoparticle interaction quite nicely. And going the opposite direction, we can CRISPR knockout SLC46A3 in a high expressing line and decrease the number of nanoparticles that are accumulating in that cell. And so that data I showed you is for our basic or bare liposome, but really what we care about is, is this generalizable across all of the lipid-based nanoparticles that we've looked at or even the, those in other labs are looking at? And we were excited to see that this was the case. It really is a lipid-based nanoparticle-specific phenomenon where you can kind of tune the interaction by tuning this one gene. And importantly, it's not 
in play for polymeric nanoparticles. So this gave us a hint that it could be a really interesting um, biomarker to think about for future studies. And so, you know, in the last slide here, I'm just going to share kind of what does this mean? As the clinician, we ask, is it relevant? And, and obviously, we know nanoparticle delivery is not just cells in addition interacting with a nanoparticle. Um, and so one of the first steps we did was say, is this relevant um, as a predictive biomarker? So we took a situation we could control. We made our own tumors that had either no expression of SLC4683 or high expression of SLC4683. And we gave the clinical analog formulation of onivide, which is meant to be a non-targeted formulation. As I showed you, it has very few biomarkers in and of itself. In fact, this is one of the few that, that showed up as a hit. And if you inject the nanoparticles directly into the tumor and look at the retention, or if you give repeat IV doses and look at the accumulation, we were very surprised and, and very excited to see that, in fact, knowing the tumor level of this one gene was um, enabling you to predict the accumulation and retention of, in this case, a non-targeted formulation. And so we think this might be a different way to think about using nanoparticles, um, and maybe just hopefully the first one of, of many stories from a convergent science story like this. And so with that, I hope I've um, shared with you a little bit today about what we can do when we kind of all get together from different sides of the table and start thinking about things from a different angle. Um, that po pooled screening and, and omics actually has a really large role to play in nanoparticle delivery. And we're very excited about the implications this may have for machine learning, designing new nanoparticles, and potentially um, having therapeutic potential. And with that, I would like to really um, thank all of those that, that were part of this project, um, those that are in my lab now, my brand new lab that have joined today. Thank you guys, um, and all of our funding sources. Thank you.